What happened at Appomattox Courthouse? The year is 1865, almost four years to the day the American Civil War has broken out with the firing on Fort Sumter. Since then, it's been a slow but almost inevitable decline of the Confederate States of America, reaching their high watermark in 1863. By now, the Army of Northern Virginia is at its lowest point. There is little for ammunition, little for guns, little for horses. There are basically no more men for replacements, but most importantly, there is no food. In fact, the Army of Northern Virginia at its peak was approximately 92,000 men in 1862. By April of 1865, that number had fallen by 30,000 men. This is the predicament befalling General Robert E. Lee, the man who is in essence the face of the Confederacy. How can he carry on when he's losing more men to fatigue, starvation, and even desertion than actually falling on the battlefield? I'm Adam Noyce. And I won't sit here and pretend that I am what academia would consider an expert in these matters, nor certainly the most well-versed person on the American Civil War, but I won't deny how much the American Civil War has fascinated me ever since I can remember. I've obsessed about it, and Appomattox Courthouse is one of the many theaters of this tragic war that I've mused over since learning about it. I will say, though, that a list of sources will be put in the description below. So anything I miss, there will be, and you know, there will be stuff that I miss, can be found there as well. No one in a million years would have thought that Appomattox Courthouse would be where the bloodiest war in American history would essentially end. Appomattox Courthouse was at the time owned by a fellow named Wilmer McLean. Wilmer McLean had at one time owned a large farm outside of Manassas. If you don't know where Manassas is, it's where the first and second battles of Bull Run were fought. Or, if you're from the south, the first and second battle of Manassas. The north liked to name battles after rivers and streams, while the south often named them after the closest town. Anyways, McLean was sick of being so close to the fighting all the time. So he and his family decided to pack up lock, stock, and barrel, and found a place they thought the war simply would never come a place at Appomattox Courthouse. Now, what's interesting about Wilmer McLean, to go on a tangent for a bit here, is that he and his brother had actually become quite wealthy, millionaires by today's standards, actually, by smuggling Cuban sugar to fellow Confederates. And that meant running the Union blockade, which many, many people have tried to do and failed, and they were very successful at this. But the problem they soon found was that the money that they had gotten was Confederate money, which by 1864 was looking to be more and more and more useless. So if the war ended, the McLeans would probably, you know, lose most of what they had. They'd be bankrupt. And that's exactly what happens. And, and apparently McLean loves to leave this side of the story out. He likes to ignore it. Uh, instead, what he did was he talked up how it was so ironic that he owned a house where, in essence, the Civil War began and where the Civil War Ended. And I gather that's where he made most of his fame from, was telling these sorts of stories. Nevertheless, by April of 1865, the war McLean so desperately wanted to avoid had come to his backyard, which lends heavily into the idea set forth by Charles Royster that this was a modern total war. Every aspect of life for the South had been consumed and destroyed by the American Civil War. Let's look at Richmond, a bustling metropolis in Southern standards, now turned to nothing but ash. Look at Sherman's march to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah, where everything was either burnt, eaten, or sabotaged. This crippled the already decaying Confederacy and helped bring the Civil War to its end. It choked the Confederacy. It stopped the wheels from turning, both literally on a supply chain standpoint and spiritually from a common man, common soldier viewpoint. Add to that General Grant's brilliant, brilliant strategy of not targeting Richmond, but targeting General Lee's army. I'd argue a lot that uh, most of the bloodshed for the first half of the war was often drawn because Union generals were clouded by this idea that Richmond had to fall, that if Richmond falls, so will the Confederacy. And maybe it would have. There's no point of speculating here because that's not what happened. Instead, 
Grant took a different approach. Grant knew that to stop the fighting, he needed to target the enemy's army. But at the same time, he also managed to get Abraham Lincoln on board and Washington in suit. And this strategy worked in droves, pinning Lee down and forcing Lee to continuously expunge his manpower, depleting his strength and ability to rage war. By April of 1865, Lee truly understood that the jig was up. Any further fight would be needless. And to his credit, he didn't want any more lives thrown away needlessly for a lost cause. Lee had been defeated. The Confederacy had lost the war. Let's set the stage a bit more here by saying that Appomattox is the place where two of the most titanic and iconic generals, not just of the American Civil War, but in the world, met face to face. Here were the two faces that we'd consider in military leadership. We have Lee, who exemplifies Southern aristocracy, prim and proper, elegant. He's the kind of man a common soldier would see as a true leader, someone to look up to, someone looking out over them, a father or grandfather figure. Then there's Grant, known for getting down and dirty and in the trenches, covered in mud. He was one of the boys. He didn't come from a well-known or, or well-to-do family. He was no different than most of the people actually in the field. He was one of the boys. And these two opposing personalities form the basis of the old way of leadership versus the new. Lee being the old way of leadership, Grant basically kicking down the doors and becoming the new way of leadership. In fact, while Lee wore his best uniform and cleaned up riding off to Appomattox, Grant was covered in mud in his standard uniform. He had no sidearms, he wasn't wearing gloves, uh, some of his uniform was torn and ripped, and the only thing to indicate his rank was actually some ripped and used shoulder strains. There's a lot of Lost Cause literature out there that says that this was an insult to old Bobby Lee. But that's not true. That's not true at all. And it's simply a character assassination of General Grant. Grant wasn't insulting Lee by arriving muddy. That's not what he was doing at all. He was in a hurry. He got word that Lee wanted to talk, and Grant dropped everything he was doing and booked it to Appomattox, not wanting to keep Lee waiting. Lee arrived at Appomattox with three people. All the while, Grant, on the other hand, had his entire entourage with him, including General Philip Sheridan. Before entering the house, Grant told his men to wait outside while he personally greeted General Lee, who had been waiting there at this point for about 30 minutes. The two generals apparently shook hands and from all accounts spoke about their ventures in the Mexican-American War. This, in essence, broke the ice in many ways and allowed the surrender negotiations to commence. Now, what could both men have been feeling here? It's hard to say, especially with General Lee. Lee never wrote a memoir, and the only other person who was a Confederate in the room was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Marshall. While for the Union, there was the Chief of Cavalry, Philip Sheridan, Chief of Staff, John uh, Rollins, Inspector General Seth Williams, and Maury, who's who on the uh, northern side of the Eastern Campaign. So we have a lot of northern perspectives here, the most important one being Grant himself, but only a few from the southern perspective. So without a doubt, there was a level of respect that both men certainly felt for each other. Lee had never faced an adversary quite like Grant before, and who are we kidding? Lee often gave Grant a huge run for his money. Many books show this respect, certainly, but I don't believe that's all they felt. I mean, both men knew this was a, a major moment, don't get me wrong. This was an end of the war, in essence. Lee seemed to have a sense of bitterness throughout this meeting. And that's not me knocking Lee. I mean, who wouldn't feel bitter? This isn't a basketball game. We're talking about a war where the South alone lost over 250,000 men. Lee feeling bitter would seem only natural. To be beaten by Grant, who isn't well-dressed, has come from nowhere and nobody, probably added some salt to the wound, even if that wasn't Grant's intention at all. Because say what you will about the Reconstruction and, and even Grant himself, but I truly believe that his intentions with the surrender were genuine. Now these conditions were very lax 
to say the least. And I would say that the Confederates got off easy here, and there's no denying that. Lee, and the Confederates for that matter, were in no shape to dictate any terms. And if someone else had been at the table, or even if we had Grant from the beginning of the war sitting at this table, probably that is exactly what would have happened. Ulysses S. Grant liked to go by the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant back in 1862 and 1863. His call for complete and unconditional surrender from the South is the stuff of legends. That letter is legendary. But then Vicksburg happened. And despite Grant racking up a rather high body count before this and after this, there's no denying that seeing this carnage had actually softened the man quite a bit. It humbled him a bit, perhaps. No longer was this about getting revenge on the South for him, as so many of his fellow generals wanted from, from the Union. Grant saw a bigger picture here. Grant saw that in order to fully heal the massive and almost mortal wounds casted by the Civil War, that the North would need to have a gentle touch. And Lincoln thought the same thing. Lincoln thought the same way. Any harsh or brash hands would result in a massive backlash against the North, both in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of true resentment, and that's exactly what happened after Lincoln was assassinated. But inside Appomattox, neither man really spoke to each other directly, neither Lee nor Grant. Most of the correspondence between Grant and Lee had been penned out on paper and passed back and forth. The language here is so formal, so dense, so carefully said that the tension here could probably be cut with a knife, even if that wasn't the true intention by either party. Grant proposed paroling all of Lee's men to lay down their arms and hand them over to the Union, and they'd be disbanded from taking up arms against the United States ever again. These are very lenient terms, to which Lee accepted. Lee formally asked for these conditions to be written out, to which Grant wrote out the terms himself with a pencil. He noticed Lee's sword, and on the spot decided to allow the officers to keep their sidearms, horses, and baggage. This further smooths over the misgivings the Southerners may have had towards the Northerners. This book was also then passed back to Lee, where he cleaned his glasses, almost stalling, and he silently read the conditions. Lee points out that General Grant had forgotten the word exchange, and offers to put it in himself. Grant agrees, and has his aide Porter give Lee a pencil to write it in. But Lee goes one step further. He then asks Grant to let his soldiers who have their own horses to keep them, to which Grant and the others seem surprised by. This was far beyond and exceeded the norms of accepting terms of surrender. What Lee had done here is put General Grant on the spot. Perhaps Lee was testing the waters to see what he could get away with. To Grant's credit, he lets any Confederate soldier who claims to own a horse to be allowed to keep it. This certainly shocked several of his staff, but they kept quiet. On Grant's staff is a full-blooded Seneca Native American named Eli Parker. Grant has him write down the official terms. I bring this up because while this is all happening, George Armstrong Custer was outside, and I find it funny how a Native American drafts the official wording of the surrender while Custer is forced to stay outside. Those who know Custer's fate will understand what I mean by the irony of that situation. But Custer was supposed to be in the building with the others. He was late. In fact, he had recently been totally rebuffed by Confederate General James Longstreet when he demanded complete and unconditional surrender from him. From all accounts, that exchange had been hot-tempered and full of yelling. It just goes to show that there's a place for brashness and harshness, and also a place for compassion and gentleness, and Grant was the clear victor here. Now, to be clear, no single surrender article was written at Appomattox. Nevertheless, the papers drawn up by Parker were signed by Lee first, then Grant, and by all intents and purposes, the surrender was complete. But Lee has one last twist up his sleeve. He explains to Grant that they have thousands of Union prisoners and are also in desperate need of rations, both in which are true. Lee specifically refers to a train full of rations asking Grant 
if they could have them so his men could be fed. However, said train had been captured by Philip Sheridan already. It had already fallen into Union hands. Did Lee actually know that this had happened, or was this a ploy to get one last concession out of Grant? Now, despite this curveball, Grant agrees to give Lee's men 25,000 rations, food Lee's men desperately needed. Now, what did all this accomplish? In essence, this meeting is not just a capitulation of the Army of Northern Virginia, but it also assures that the soldiers will not be tried as traitors, that they can go home, that if they had horses, that they can keep them and help them for the coming season's crops, officers can keep their sidearms, Lee's men will be fed, etc., etc., etc. You can't get better terms of surrender than this. They both sign the documents, and Lee makes for his leave. But as if Grant hadn't shown his classiness before, as he exits the building, he takes off his hat and salutes General Lee. His entourage then follows suit, and Lee returns the gesture. Now this is the ultimate sign of respect. Despite just beating him, Grant is refusing to rub salt in the wounds. The mending on his part has begun. It isn't until April 12th of 1865 that the day comes where the Army of Northern Virginia actually lays down their arms. And who else presides over this other than Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, known for his heroic deeds at the Battle of Little Round Top at Gettysburg? There are some sources that say that this event never actually happened, but the fact that we have corresponding evidence from Chamberlain himself and also General John Brown Gordon, to me, says that it did happen. Gordon is a controversial figure, don't get me wrong, but is nevertheless an underrated general from the CSA that deserves more attention, in my humble opinion. So while Gordon's men are marching up, surrounded by Union soldiers, Chamberlain orders his men to order arms, then to carry. Gordon seemed to be surprised by this show of respect. Chamberlain basically noticed how downtrodden Gordon was riding on his sickly horse, and Gordon returned that salute having his men do the same. They are saluting each other. Now, Chamberlain defends his decision for this salute, not as a cause for which the Confederacy stood, but to its going down before the flag of the Union. He wrote that in the book, The Passing of the Armies. So at Appomattox, the Army of Northern Virginia surrenders, but this isn't the only army the South has. In North Carolina, remained Joseph E. Johnson's army, which seemed to be larger than the Army of Northern Virginia. The number range that was given is above 90,000 men, and they surrendered to General Sherman on April 26th. General Richard Taylor surrenders his army, along with the governments of Alabama, Mississippi, and eastern Louisiana on May 4th, 1865, and finally Jefferson Davis dissolves the Confederate government on May 5th, 1865. So in less than a month after Appomattox, the Confederacy ends as a body effectively, also ending the American Civil War. A war which brought between 600 and 700,000 deaths, more deaths than any other war ever fought by the United States. But not only has this war ended, but Lincoln was working hard to pass the 13th Amendment of the Constitution abolishing slavery in the United States, ending a massive blight on our country's history once and for all. Now, I know that Reconstruction ended up being, you know, bringing back antebellum politics and, and the horrors, you know, African Americans had to basically endure right up through the civil rights movements in the 1960s and 1970s. But nevertheless, slavery itself is no longer allowed in this country, and thank God for that. So what happened at Appomattox Courthouse? A tremendous event, which brought about a rapid ending to the bloodiest and nastiest conflict in American history. And it needs to be remembered. It was the beginnings of Reconstructions, even, a sign of what people like Grant and Lincoln wanted, which was not to harshly punish the South for what they did, but basically nurture them back into the Union in the hopes of keeping bitterness and hatred from festering and leading to further complications down the line. It's an astonishing what-if scenario to ask yourself what if Abraham Lincoln had not been assassinated and instead we saw his form of reconstruction instead of his successor who himself was against the ratification of the 14th Amendment ensuring equal rights and full citizenship to particularly former slaves. 
So, with all that being said, go on Facebook and like AN Productions and get all up-to-date information of what we're doing. All my links to my social media is in the link below. Expect more history videos like this to come out in the future. Tell me what you think. I love hearing the different perspectives on history. I love reading. I love learning and stuff. And I know I've left stuff out here. I couldn't do this all or else I'd be here for about six hours. But tell me stuff. I want to learn. I want to learn more. And I'm, I'm hoping to do more of this and turn this into a series itself because history truly is my, my, my big, big, big passion here. So, And I want to show my excitement for it by doing these videos. But anyways... In the end, this is Adam Noyce of A.N. Productions saying, Sayonara.